So one day, I'm going to, Lord willing, if he is faithful, I'm going to make it to meet Miriam in Sudan, right? Terry and I support little Miriam and also some missionaries over there. And today on your way out, if you feel led, make sure you stop by there and do the same thing. You know, um, our community has gone through a great tragedy. Many of you know about um, Alec. And uh, when you stop and you place yourself in his mom's shoes or in his dad's life, and uh, you, you suddenly, life kind of just stops. If you don't know what I'm talking about, last week um, Alec was walking to school and was hit, and the driver fled, and later to be known possibly under DUI. You know, it affects a whole school. It cer certainly affects um, two families, but also people within this church. First person on the scene, a nurse here. First sign of the faithfulness of God. But yet, she is, uh, her life has changed. When we um, come across things like this, you, you, you ask yourself why, you ask yourself where was God, you ask yourself all kinds of questions that start tumbling through your mind, and then you just have to settle on this, this one fact that in spite of what my eyes see and what my heart feels, that God is present and he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. And I have certainly seen that on this side of that day, I have seen God's ever-present help in a time of trouble, but yet it's still hard, it's very hard. And so I'm just going to ask us to stand and let us pray for our community and for these two families and those involved. Also, Alex's aunt and uncle attends the church here. And many of you have probably touched some way uh, Alec. A lot, he plays sports, and, and so many of people in that community know him and loved him. And so now we just commit this time to you, Lord. We commit uh, this, this morning to you, and we commit these two families to you, Lord, because honestly, we don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. We know that our community is rallied in trying to support and trying to honor this young man. We pray not only for that man's, that Alex's family, Lord, but for all those whose lives have been touched that day, the school, his classmates that are in this church this morning, Father, we lift up your name and we pray that you would, as we, we, we sang this morning, that you would reign over it, Lord, that you would rule and reign over this tragedy. Lord, we pray that you would help and that you would calm and that you would bring peace and that you would bring strength and you would bring hope from this tragedy, Lord. We pray for the family of the woman, Lord, that was driving. We pray for those children. We pray for her and her husband and we pray that our sovereign God, our gracious Heavenly Father, would come and, and heal. Lord, I don't know what we would do without you, but we know that we can do all things with you. And so we pray, Father, that you would do things that none of us could do, that you would just pour out your spirit upon this situation and bring hope and healing in life. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Also, uh, Dave... Uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. You know, I think the timing is perfect in terms of where we're at in Scripture because how many of you have, have uh, you know, just the other day, we have, Gra we have Grayson with us the last three or four days, and, and uh, I had two things to do this day, this one day, and I told Grayson, I promised you Papa's going to do, and I went, ugh! Because I remember when I was a little boy, and if my dad promised me something, and he didn't follow through on that promise, I was devastated. I mean, I was completely devastated. My day would be ruined, and, and then the next time my dad promised me something, what happens? Yeah, all of a sudden, this little innocent boy, this little innocent child, all of a sudden has seen that people will let you down. 
And you cannot run away from it. It is going to happen. It is just plain and simple going to happen. And so we have this grid or we have this understanding that, that people will let us down or, or that we can't, you know, we can't just trust people. And, and there's just this, this grid that we walk through or these sunglasses, if you will, that we look through that keeps us kind of in check. Are you, do you really mean that? And unfortunately, because we have been let down in so many ways, we translate that in the way we relate to God. We look at him and we go, really? I don't know. Can I trust you with my life? Can I trust you with my tomorrow? I don't really know. And so I know that when, when tragedies like this happen, if, if your faith is kind of already shaky, then it could just draw you further away from God because you really can't trust him now. Or his heart starts to speak to you in your, in your, in your hurting. He starts to speak to you in that place and it draws you closer it's either going to be one or the other. In, um, in the scripture that we're in this morning is in Galatians 5, chapter 22. I'm just going to read it again. Because it deals with the fruit of the Spirit. If God is in us, then these, this fruit should emanate from us. Right? It's, it's not plural. We've been learning this. It's singular. And so all of this fruit that is, that is listed here in Galatians 5 is given to us because, listen, well, this is very important. And we're going to try to, if, if you are in here this morning and you're trying to walk by faith and you're struggling with it, I pray that this morning when you walk away from here, you have a little more firmness underneath you. You have a little more stability underneath you. That this faith of ours is not blind faith. It is a faith that is, that is based in something that is true. It's not blind. If I, if I say I have faith that those clouds are going to turn into daisies, <laughs> would you like me to preach that message this morning? <laughs> but if I have faith that God is faithful and just to forgive me of all of my sin, that's a true statement. All right, now, the faithfulness of God is listed inside of the fruit, in Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Everyone say faithfulness. Faithful. Gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Thursday morning had a great analogy that was given to all of us. Uh, Lloyd and Cheryl go here. Lloyd is blind. Everything is dark. And at their home group, and I'm just going to put a plug in for home groups, you can sign up for home groups anytime you want. It's in the lobby, okay? You don't have to go because they're in the middle of something. You could go. Just go, okay? I can't tell you enough about how important it is, that's where the life of the church is inside of home groups. I've been hearing all these amazing reports, including this one. The home group moved uh, Cheryl and Lloyd. The home group, not the church, but the church in the home group moved them. They were in a, they were in a crisis and they went there and they helped move them. But that week, they had home group and the analogy of, that, that came out about this being in step with the spirit that Marty talked about last week was that if you watch Lloyd, he is not by choice, but by blindness, has to stay in step with Cheryl. If you watch, when they come into church, he's got his hand on her shoulder, and every step that she takes, he has to take. And we were kind of joking with him, and uh, in that we said, man, that, that's a perfect analogy. He goes, but you know what? It's also very humbling. It's also very hard to keep in, st up in step with my wife at times. <laughs> and us that have sight can, un can understand that, right? And so, but there's this perfect picture of him walking behind his wife and now put his wife and her name is Jesus. And you're walking in step with Jesus and you're walking in step with Jesus. And if you got your hand on him and he has his hand on you, he'll be faithful, as Tony said, to complete the work that he started in you. And if your hand is on him and you're walking in step with his spirit, then it will, the spirit is at war with your flesh and it will crucify the passions of your flesh. And out from it is life, the wellspring of life. Out from it is not your flesh and your own passion, but life. And life is filled with this fruit. 
and one of the fruits is faithfulness. Okay, now, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. We're going to step into one of God's promises. I try to put this scripture in every week that I can because it's a promise of God, right? It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How does it come? How does this promise come? Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His, His precious and very great promises. This is God given us a promise. It's precious to Him and it's very great. So that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature. It's a promise that God wants us to partake of His nature, to bear this fruit. Having escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. I stood here at a church almost 40 years ago. This brings no glory to me. It's just my story. I sit here, pastor was here, hung over from the bachelor party. My beautiful wife, who had rededicated her life to the Lord during our premarital counseling, was just brilliant in God's glory. She had told me that, we're, that we are going to separate ourselves because I was not faithful before marriage with her, and we're going to honor God in this relationship. And she did, and I was angry. And I came to the altar a confused, angry, selfish, full of my own passions, confused, and isolated, and not knowing how to get out of it, didn't know Jesus, even though I watched my wife follow Jesus, and I promised to be faithful. Slipped the ring on, I promised to be faithful. Promises to be faithful. What I failed to do, what I failed to do was to realize in that moment how faithful God is. How faithful He is. And as I have got to know God, as I have got to understand God, then His righteousness starts to fulfill my desires of, of all these other things. And now I want to fear Him so that I could maintain this right standing with God. That's a healthy fear. But I, I broke the promise. Just one time, but it might as well have been a lifetime. So when I broke the promise, my wife didn't know. And when I came to faith in Christ, something inside of me, his name was Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit said, you know what, whether you realize it or not, that this, this problem is within your marriage, you need to get it into the light. You guys, this brings no honor to me at all. And I stood there because I had to trust God. I had to trust God that He was good, even though I was bad. I had to trust God that He was good and that I could share this to my wife and that He would get us through it. And I knew that I didn't deserve it. And now all of a sudden, the gospel becomes alive inside of me. It wasn't just Jesus on a cross. It was my wife dying in front of me. And then her forgiving me. And it changed my life as I saw the faithfulness of my wife. And I've maintained a faithful position in my marriage ever since. But not by my might, not by my power, but by His Spirit. And so when a man, this, this coming weekend, I'm going to tell everybody right now, that David and Rosa are getting married. David Prater and Rosa Williams are getting married here next Saturday. And as they stand there, when the man talks about protecting his wife, the man has to understand that he must protect himself first. He must guard his own heart. How could he possibly help hers and secure hers without guarding his own, his own heart? Now, faithfulness means firmness. Faithfulness means security. Faithfulness means a rock. Now, I have proven to my wife one time that I am not that firm. Since then, the firmness has been, it's been building. Build, build your life. Build your life. Build your life on what? On the firm foundation of God, not your own. 
And little by 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 little, she trusts me. But God, He is someone else. He is someone not like us. He is not a man, the Scripture says, that He should lie. When He says it, He will accomplish it. Now I want to take you through some Scripture that blows my mind. I remember when I felt called to the ministry and called by God to go and and, and preach the Gospel. Um, I was kind of doing that already at Craftsman for Christ, but I knew that God had more, and I didn't know what the more was. But I knew I wanted to go, but I had to wait. I had to wait on that promise that He would take me to this place. Imagine being totally incapable, an adulterer, a liar, a, you know, a drunkard like me, and all these other things, an angry man, and that God would want to use me? What this does, what this says is, is that it proves that He is faithful. Not me, that He is faithful. We learned here a while back that God does things for His name's sake. He does things for, I remember my dad when I was growing up, he wasn't a Christian, and we weren't Christians, but he said, hey listen, Bob, your name means something. The Oot's name means something, and I don't want to read it unless it's in the sports page. (laughs) And I never forgot that. And it kind of checked me at times. Oh my God, I don't want to get in trouble. That was my dad. But look at God says, my name means something. I am. I am. And I do things for my name's sake, he says. For my name's sake, I'm going to uphold my promise because his name rides on the promise. And so he makes it come to pass. Sometimes 400 years later, but it comes to pass. Right now, all of us on this side of Jesus' resurrection are waiting on the promise. What's the promise? That he's going to return. Can you believe it? Well, go back in Scripture and look at the promises that God made and who He made them to, right? I remember when I was waiting on the Lord, I've shared with with a few people, is that I wanted to understand why do the old saints in the Bible refer to God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Everybody said He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob. Why, anybody know why? Did you know that Jesus referred to God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when He was speaking to the Pharisees and the Pharisees were denying the resurrection? He goes, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and He's not talking to the dead but the living. He's the God of the living, not the dead. You'll see that in Scripture in a minute. Okay? So, <clears throat> let's just start in um, Genesis Okay, And we'll take you through what happened to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm just going to give you a summation real quick before we get into Genesis chapter 12. The promise was first made to Abraham, then he confirmed it to his son Isaac, and then the promised land, the promise was then given to Isaac's son Jacob, right? So the, Abraham had a son named Isaac, who had a son named Jacob. Right? So there's three generations of this promise. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, here's the three promises that he's telling him. You're going to be blessed. You're going to have a great land. You're going to have a great name. But the name is going to come because you will be the descendants of many. There will be many descendants from you. Right? Now, we have a problem. He didn't even know where he was going to go. He said, when you get there, I'll tell you. So the first thing he has to do is exercise this thing called faith, right? Now, when he finds out that he's supposed to be the father of many, more descendants will come from him than all the stars in the universe, the Lord told him through an angel, right? What was the problem? 
What was wrong with his wife? No, she wasn't just old. She was barren. That means she could not have children. So God made a promise to a man that didn't have a land, that wasn't blessed, and had married a wife that could have no children, and makes a promise. Can you trust him? Wow. The God of Abraham. Remember who his wife was? Sarah. And when she was old, she had a baby. Remember who the baby was? Isaac. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, here comes Isaac, right? Now, I'm not going to go to the altar with Isaac. We're going to go to the next generation. Now, the, the land was described to, to Abraham of the, the portion, the size, and where it was. It is known to us as what? The promised land, right? Now, here he comes to, uh, to Isaac in Genesis 26, verse 3. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. This is God speaking to him. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands. Right? Here it comes again, the same blessing. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you offspring. Okay? And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. Okay, here he goes. He goes, I said to Abraham I was going to do this, and I'm telling you that I told Abraham that I was going to do this, and by the way, your mama couldn't have kids until I came through on my promise. And your name is Isaac. Now Isaac, at this time, he's in some land that, that, that doesn't even have water. He was in a bad way. He wasn't feeling blessed. And God made a promise to him too. And said, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and I will give to your offspring all these lands and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Watch this. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. See, one thing about, about me personally, I have maintained a faithful position in my marriage because God, His faithfulness has come up inside of me, and I desire, I desire, I desire to be faithful back. It's, it's, it's two parts. It's His faithfulness connected to my response. This is where the fruit of faithfulness comes out. All right? It's first a response to Him, then your community. He says um, to, to Isaac, He says, um, and then the Lord appeared to him that same night and said, look at, look at this, this is so good. You guys, I did, not, I did not discover this until this week studying for this message. Because I discovered the fact why they call him Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I didn't know that God introduced this to his people. He said, the Lord appeared to Isaac that same night and he said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not. I am with you, and I will bless you, and I will multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. Now, anybody here want to tell me who Isaac's wife was? Anybody? Rebecca. Okay, he's in a place where there's no water. He just told he was going to be blessed, and God gave him a wife, Rebecca, who couldn't what? She couldn't have children either. Oh, there's starting to be a little trend with God here. He starts taking the impossible and makes it possible because His Word declares it. Amen. It's a promise. It is a promise. So Isaac, right, he goes, I have a problem. My wife can't have children. And, and I can just see God. I can't really see God, but I'm just wondering what God's thinking. Oh man, wait till your wife has a baby and then see who you are going to, to, to say hallelujah to. Right? Because of the promise. Then, guess who the child is? Jacob! <laughs> I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? So here comes Jacob. Anybody know about Jacob, right? So I'm going to read you a little story that's found in Scripture in Genesis 28 about Jacob. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. Did you guys just read this? He didn't have a pillow, he has a rock. 
Now, I don't know if this was put here because of this, but like Pastor Jerry said the other day when he was speaking, he goes, it's not in here, but it's in here. <laughs> All right? <laughs> the faithfulness of God means the firmness, the security of God. So Jacob puts his head on a rock, falls asleep, has a dream about what? About the faithfulness of God. Here's what, he's, here's what God did as he laid his head down. He said, taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head, lay down in that place to sleep, and he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, look at this, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. He starts to introduce himself as the God of Abraham and Isaac to Jacob. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Here comes the promise again. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and you and your offspring, and shall all the families of the earth be blessed. There he comes the blessing again. Behold, you guys listen. Behold, I am with you. Yes. And you're going to see in a minute, it really is us. Because we're heirs of Abraham. Your offspring. Okay, so behold, I'm with you and keep you wherever you go. On the side of the road or in the middle of getting a bad report. Wherever you're at, I'm going to be with you. You can trust me. I'm not like a man. Trust him. I'll bring you back for this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised to you. Now, you guys, who was Jacob's wife? Rachel. Rebecca? Rachel. It's okay. Sarah, Rebecca, and then Rachel. What was wrong with Rachel? She couldn't have children either. Are you kidding me? God, we have a problem. And by the way, Jacob was kicked out of his father's house and, and he ran off with a lie, right? And he goes to his uncle's house and he was deceived, right? So you think that he's believing that he's going to be blessed as he lays his head down on a rock? You're going to bless me? Really? You're going to give me great land and, and I, I'm over here serving my uncle and and, 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 and you give me this wife and she can't have kids? And you're telling me that all this is going to happen? And he said, yeah, because I am the God of Abraham. And I am the God of Isaac, and now I'm the God of Jacob. And he has, he has two children with Rachel. The promise fulfilled. And it goes on until Joseph, right? inherits the promise and steps into the promised land. But just like all of these people, some of those promises, listen, this is important, go unfulfilled until the next generation, until the next generation, until the next generation. And just like us, the promise of seeing Him is unfulfilled until the promise is fulfilled. Now watch this. This is, this is fascinating to me. So now we fast forward. We fast forward. We, we, we fast forward to right before Jesus is born. Right? And he appears, the angel appears to Zechariah in the temple. Zechariah is a priest. And he appears to Zechariah in the temple. And, and he says, hey, Zechariah, hey, Zechariah, uh, I'm going to give you a son, and he's going to be a forerunner to the Messiah. He's going to be a forerunner to the Messiah. Yes, the Messiah that was promised all these years ago. He, he, your son is going to be John the Baptist. And he goes, my wife, my wife, Elizabeth, she can't have kids. Are you kidding me? Why does God go to the impossible to make the possible happen? So that we would know him as the God of Abraham. Isaac, and Jacob. That we would know Him in a very difficult time that my God will come through. That we would know Him in a really hard place 
then my God is going to be with me. He's not going to leave me until I see him face to face. And out of that comes my faith. Out of that becomes my faith. It's a gift. Out of that becomes my ability to to stay true to what I say. It's a gift. The fruit of faithfulness. I know people that are in this church that blow my mind. They're working as ushers. They're working in the children's. They're working in the parking lot. They are so faithful that I'm getting mad at them because they're not sitting in the church. I'm sorry, I'm not getting mad at them. I'm, I'm trying to encourage them. They're so faithful, they just want to serve, right? And so if I get to heaven, I'm, I'm going to get to heaven. Let me say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to hear this little dull voice. Well done, good and faithful servant. But I'm going to hear him yelling at those guys, well done, Stan Cantrell, you good and faithful servant. Come on into my rest. Does Stan forgive? Is Stan a good steward of his family? Is Stan, is Stan serving out there? Yes. But, but can Stan humble himself before the mighty hand of God so that Stan could be lifted up? That's a faithful man. That's a faithful man. We have another man that's in the fountains right now, Dave Brabeck, who works in the sound booth. He's going to be there all the way through the end of probably November. Who knows? He wants to get out sooner. But he, but, he, but he has some complications. He has a horrible, horrible bed sore that, that's thre- life-threatening. And it happened from laying on a gurney waiting to be seen at Rideout. I'm not blaming Rideout. He has very sensitive skin. But he broke his foot, you guys. His foot was like this, and it turned like that. I know. Don't, have, don't ask to look at the picture. Dave's a faithful man. He loves the Lord. He's sitting over there at fountains waiting for faithful men to go visit him so he won't get depressed. Now listen, in the middle of the fountains or in the middle of a bad report, we should be able to put our head on a rock at night. His name is Jesus, the one that God promised Right? The one that God promised. And wait till you see this. This is just so crazy. So he goes to this barren woman, and she conceives Elizabeth, and then she goes to, he goes to an unmarried woman and said, you're going to have a baby, and you're going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Did he come through on that promise? What was his name? Jesus is otherwise known as Faithful and true. Don't you see how the two of those go together? You can't have truth without faithfulness. You can't have faithfulness without truth. They go together. And I'm going to tell you something else. In the fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness is the glue that holds it all together. And right now, if you are walking in duplicity, in other words, you've got one foot in the world and you've got one foot towards Jesus, you know what? You're not faithful or you're not true. I'm sorry, you're just not. And I can tell you that if, if, if part of your day is, it, 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 you're going you're gonna to be confused at times because we all have temptations, right? But guess what Jesus says? The Holy Spirit in Corinthians, He says that you will not be tempted above what you can bear because He is faithful to provide for you a means of escape. So you see, God starts to use His faithfulness and apply it to us. And I'm going to read you a couple of scriptures that are just really, really, really good to rest on this grace of God and the faithfulness of God. If you turn to, um, let's see here, <clears throat> turn to uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 32. And this is that scripture that I said a minute ago. I want to make sure that you see it in person. So Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees about the resurrection. He says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not a God of the dead, but of the living. God is alive. He is alive, and He is faithful. And when He talks about that you will be resurrected, that's a promise. 
And he's telling the Pharisees, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew who that was. They knew that he was a God of promises. All right, so go to 1 John 1, 9. How many of you struggle with the concept that he can truly forgive you of your sin? Raise your hand. Wow. Wow. There's one, one of you that, that raised your hand and I would have never known that. I'm glad I know that. So let the Word of God speak to you. Do you believe that He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Does anybody not believe that? Do you believe that He died for you? Anybody not believe that? So here's Jesus through the... Through the uh, uh, excuse me... <laughs> His disciple John, right? In 1 John 1 9. You put that scripture up there? 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, not you, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Everyone, you know what? Let's just stand up and say hallelujah right now. Just stand up and say hallelujah because I don't know about you. <laughs> hallelujah, right? I mean, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. You know what happens if you're not forgiven? But he is faithful. Everyone say he is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive me. Can you say that? And to talk to Don, because he's got something going on here. Have a seat. <laughs> See, faith is a gift. It's a gift. Faithfulness is the fruit from that gift. Faithfulness is a fruit from the gift of faith. When Jesus was here, he, he was trying to teach us about faith, and there was a centurion that, that, had, a, that, that had trouble believing that this, this child would be healed, and he cried out, and he says, I believe, I believe, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. If you are struggling, if you are struggling in life, and you're going, you know, kind of too far this way when you know God would rather have you go this way, if that's you, ask Him to give you more faith. If you're struggling with any of these fruits, get to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not, as Marty talked about last week, it's not something that you can just dredge up. It's the abiding in who He is that the fruit comes out of you. It's an abiding in Christ. Now, so Jesus, and, he was, and he's telling that guy about the faith, he goes, he goes listen, I, I, do you believe? He goes, yes, I believe. But help me in my unbelief. Okay? I guarantee you that if you're a real Christian, you're going to struggle at times with your belief. Don't try to hide it. When I, I see some of the things and hear some of the things that people go through, don't you know that I get rocked at times? Like, really, God? Really? And then he shows up because of his promise. And he does something just to prove that he exists all over again. He does it all the time. If you are struggling right now with some unbelief or you're struggling with who God is, I want you to go back in a time, not for when someone broke a promise to you, but I want you to go back in time where you just knew that had to have been God. When Isaac was presented to this promise by God himself, he built an altar where, they, where he got water finally. He built an altar saying, you know what? Without God's blessing, I would not have that water. I wonder how many times he went back to God's blessing to lay his head on the promises of God all over again. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when we, uh, when we see this, um, we, we see this other scripture that... God talks about how he cannot deny himself. And I want you to look at how the great length that God goes through so that he doesn't deny himself. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If we are faithless, if we are faithless, if we fail in our faith, right? He remains faithful. Why? 
Why does he remain faithful? For he cannot deny himself. He cannot deny himself. See, he is not a man. He is God. And he is faithful and just. I, 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 I've never met anybody like that. I'm sorry. So now I exercise my faith that that's who God is. He's faithful and He's just. And He will complete the work that He has established in you. That includes some things that maybe you have just put on the shelf. I'm telling you this morning, dust it off. Put a little faith back on top of that thing. Whatever that vision was, whatever that dream was, if you will, dust it off. Put a little faith there and say, God, may your will be done. A couple more scriptures. Go to Numbers chapter 23. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Oh my gosh, anybody ever had a change of mind? Well, son, I was going to take you fishing, but I changed my mind. God is not a man that he would change his mind. He's unchangeable. He, this is why the Scripture says, we look at the Scripture like this, and we, we, we want to declare stuff out of it, but it's just who he is. We want to say, okay, when Jesus said that God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, you know what he's saying? He's saying that he doesn't change. He's the same. So he says, uh, I, he said he will not do it. He says he doesn't change his mind. He said, has he said and he will not do it? Or has he spoken and he, will he not fulfill it? These are questions, right? He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said it. He does it. And I want to go back. I want to go back to you. How many of you are struggling being faithful? Yeah, this would be honest. It's a common denominator with most Christians. It's a sanctification process. It's a process. But I'm going to tell you what. Faithfulness includes being honest, those of you that just raised your hand. That's a faithful man right there. I'm struggling. That's a faithful man right there. That's a faithful woman right there. I'm struggling. I need help. That's a faithful woman. You see the picture, right? And the promise is that he'll give it to you. The promise is that he's going to declare righteousness over you and in you. And the promise is he's going to make you a faithful man. quiet in here. Think about this for a minute. How many of you are afraid to tell someone that you're going to be somewhere because you know you might let them down? Right? How, how many of you would just like to say, you know what? God, fulfill this promise that I'm about to make right now. I can't do it on my own, but you fulfill it for me right now. God, would you do it? I would just love for all of the covenant promises that we make at marriage to change. And it would just say, God, I believe in your covenant promise to protect us in our marriage. God, I believe in your covenant promise to be faithful to us in our marriage. And then walk God, watch God go to work on your marriage. When you are faithless, He remains faithful. His name depends upon it. And we, we, you know, the world discards His name or disgraces His name. Wants to take away off of the money in God we trust. Now, if you know God, if you know Him, listen, you will trust Him even when things are hard. Even when things don't seem to be right, you will trust Him because that is not the God that man makes up, but that's the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is often misunderstood because man puts God in his own image. But in this Bible, you will have trouble. In this Bible, people will die. In this Bible, people will sin. In this Bible, 
Jesus says he's coming. Jesus did come. In this Bible, Jesus said that he is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sin if you confess it, and he's done it. He's done it for me, he's done it for most of you that are in here. And the last thing, and we'll close with this, is in Revelation 19. John looked up, and he saw heaven open, verse 11. And behold, there was a white horse, the one sitting on it. He's called what? Faithful and true. Why does he come back and his name is faithful and true? Because it was a promise that he would return. And right now, we're all barren. We're all wondering, is that really going to happen? I don't, really, is that going to happen? And the promise is true. Now, you remember, remember the, the, the scripture where he declares people in, the, in, in some of the disciples uh, faithful servants during the, 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 uh, the parable of the faithful servant? Do you remember that? You know what the faithful servant was? The one that believed in the promise of his return. That's a faithful servant. Because if you believe in the promise of his return, then you are probably going to be found faithful. If you believe that at any minute that he's going to come back, I guarantee you you're going to have a rock underneath you, a firm foundation, because you are a watchman waiting for his return. That's who he calls a faithful servant. Not a person that's just serving in the church, but a person whose foot is on the rock of Christ, waiting for he who is faithful and true to return. And if you can just capture this somehow better than I described it by going back through and reading the, these scriptures, then you will be faithful as he is faithful. It's spiritual. It's, it's, it's a dynamic that I don't quite understand except I have lived it. I have found that the Holy Spirit can make a man faithful. The fruit of faithfulness can come out of a believer. I've witnessed it. When I tell guys, hey, I, I'm going to be there, guess what? If I'm not going to be there, I'm going to call them. I don't flake out. I don't flake. Unfaithful people that don't exude the fruit of faithfulness, they flake. I'm sorry, I'm just being honest. I don't want to be a flake. I want to be faithful. Anybody else? Anybody else want to be, I want a faithful life? All right. One of the other signs, if the ushers and musicians will come up, one of the other signs of, of faithfulness is consistency. You want, to teach your, you want to teach your family faithfulness? Be consistent. Listen, if you're at home and you're raising children, they want to see you consistently going to work, not calling in sick or playing video games. You want to teach your children to be faithful? then you show them how to put money in the plate when it goes by. I'm just being honest. I'm not trying to get your money. I'm just being honest. You want to teach your children to be faithful? Say, hey, it's time to wake up and go to school. You want to teach your children to be faithful? Show them how you confess when you make a mistake. You want to teach your children to be faithful? Fill in the blank. You have to be faithful. You're going to be more faithful when you understand how faithful God is. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And right now, sister, I'm not pointing you out, but I'm looking at you. He's the God of Alec. He's the God of Alec. He's a God of Grayson. He is faithful. He is true. I had someone text me and said, Pastor Bob, I'm really going through it. I'm just, just going through it. I feel like I want to cry. 
I said, go ahead and cry. His mercy is new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I'm going to sing this, and I'll come back up, hold the elements until we sing through this song. Just rejoice over the fact that God is faithful. I'm a little different. I've got a couple minutes. No one should be alone in this, okay? But find someone next to you. 
you go there, 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 there. If, you, if there's an odd number of people, then turn to the person in the aisle. I want everyone to turn towards each other as we take communion this morning. Let's try that. If someone's without someone at the end, you can come up here and do it with me. But don't take it yet. Just stand up. Turn towards the person next to you. Make sure there's no one alone. George, come up here. Anybody else alone? Everybody with someone? Oh, come here, buddy. Are you stand up there? Wait, 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 wait. Now stand up there. I want you to say something. Hello? He is the God of your life. The God. Okay. He was saying he is the God of William. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say he is the God of your name, whatever your name is. He's the God of Bob. Tony. Say it. Here's another promise from Jesus himself as we take communion together in just a moment. All that the Father has given to Jesus, nothing, nobody will be snatched out of his hands. He's not going to let you go. It's a promise. He's always going to be with you. It's a promise. He will never leave you. It's a promise. He will never forsake you. It's a promise. His mercies are new every day. It's a promise. He promises to fill you with the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. He promises to give you wisdom if you ask it. It's a promise. He cannot deny himself. His name counts on it. Father, we thank you for you. For you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Bob, and William, and George, and Alec, and Grayson. Now may that be which we hold become alive to us, become sacred to us, become enough for us, your body and your blood. A perfect sacrifice from a perfect God for imperfect people. We adore you. We worship you. Let us eat and drink together.